Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're so happy that you've tuned in with us today. Remember, at Reed Chapel, we are a church that strives to be Bible reading, Bible teaching, God-glorifying, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-filled, and disciple-making Christians. We're glad that you've tuned in with us. Remember, if you pray, don't worry. If you worry, don't pray. Eternal God, our Father, the God who knows all things and the God who sees all things, but the God who gives us the gift of free will through choice. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us safe this far. We come this morning, God, right now in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We come this morning knowing that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? We come, God, grateful for another day's journey. We're grateful for the breath that's in our body. We're grateful, God, for a reasonable portion of health and strength. We're grateful, God, for the food that you have provided for us, the food that you have put on our tables, the clothes on our back, and the shelter over our head. God, we just come this morning declaring that we love you from the bottom of our hearts and the depths of our soul. 
We invite your presence in this place today, God. We ask that you would be with us uh, through this worship experience, that you would bless every prayer prayed, every song sung, every scripture read, and the word that will go forth. We come right now, God, in the name of Jesus, asking that you will hear the, pr the prayers, cries, and laments of your people, and that you will hear our prayer and heal the land. Heal us, God, from division and strife. Heal us, God, from selfishness and mass materialism. Heal us, God, right now in the name of Jesus. We come lifting up all of those who are on our sick and shut in list. We ask, oh God, that you would touch all members on our sick and shut in list from the top of their heads, God, to the sole of their feet and be a healing and comforting presence in their lives. We come this morning lifting up all of our caregivers, God, right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Let them know that there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, God. No, not one, God. No, not one. We come lifting up all educators and teachers and administrators and all students and parents, God, in school. We come right now, God, just asking that you will just let you just let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. We come right now, God, recognizing that we are all sinners who are saved by your grace, your mercy, and your love. And God, we just simply say thank you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will order our steps in your word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. <laughs>
to Numbers chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. We'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Numbers chapter 12, from the New King James Version. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O oh God, I pray. It's giving time. You know, we serve a God who keeps on giving. And the God who woke us up this morning and started us on our way keeps on giving to us every single day of our lives. He gives us life, health, strength, uh, shelter over our head, family, friends, employment. God gives to us because God loves us. And all God really requires from us in return is a relationship. God requires, he set it up years ago, that we are to give back a small portion of which he has blessed us to manage to give back to him. The God we serve is a giving God. Do you not know that all tithing is, is an ordering of our lives? All tithing really does is state to the world and to ourselves that God comes first. We are to give 10% of our time, our talent, and our treasure back to God. If we give God the first tenth, that means God is a priority. The question is always going to be, is God a priority? Is God a priority in the way we spend our money? Is God a priority in the way we spend our time? Is God a priority in the way we spend our talent? God comes first. Really, the, the book of Job says, naked I came into the world and naked I will leave. Nothing that we have, nothing that we take, nothing that we earn, nothing that we buy can we take with us to the next stage of life. But the reality is God has blessed us to be able to manage material possessions. Do you not know that some people are so attached to material possessions that those things become their gods. But we serve a true and a living God, and his name is Jesus. If you are desiring to give up your time, your talent, and your treasure, and you're ready to give your tithe and your offering this morning, let's pray together. Gracious God, who is the giver of every good and perfect gift, we come this morning declaring that we love you and that we adore you. We worship you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be stewards and managers of all the possessions that you have placed in our hands. We thank you, Lord, for your biblical mandate of tithing. We recognize, God, that you come first in our lives, and it is our pleasure, God, to give you back 10% of our time, our talent, and our treasure. God, we present to you this morning our tithe and our offering, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you will be pleased with what we give. We ask, O oh God, that you receive our tithe and our offerings, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Life and Legacy of Judge Jane Bolin Born on April 11, 1908, Jane Matilda Bolin was the first black woman to become a judge in the United States. 
Bolin, 31, was appointed to the New York City Domestic Relations Court by Mayor LaGuardia in 1939. Jane Bolin's passion for advocacy and social justice emerged early on during her childhood. Bolin was born in Poughkeepsie, New York, to Gaius C. Bolin and Matilda Ingram Emery Bolin. Her father was a renowned Black lawyer, and her mother was an immigrant from the British Isles. Growing up, Bolin was fascinated to be around her father's law office, surrounded by his leather-bound books. In 1924, Bolin attended Wellesley College, a women's college in Massachusetts. She was one of only two Black students in her class. Bolin graduated from Wellesley College as a Wellesley Scholar in 1928. When Bolin considered applying to Yale Law School, she was discouraged by a career advisor at Wellesley due to her race and gender, which was one of the many instances of discrimination she experienced during her time at Wellesley. She was one of three women in her class at Yale Law School and the only black woman. Nonetheless, Bolin persisted and she attained a Juris Doctorate degree from Yale Law School in 1931. She was also the first black woman to earn a law degree from the Yale Law School, breaking another glass ceiling at the tender age of 23. Later, Bolin started working at the New York City Corporation Council's office and soon became the first black woman to work as the New York City Corporation Council's assistant corporate counsel. On July 22, 1939, Jane Bolin was sworn in as a judge of the New York City Domestic Relations Court, becoming the first black female judge in the United States. For 20 years, she was the only black female judge in the country. She worked to encourage racially integrated child services, ensuring that probation officers were assigned without regard to race or religion, and that publicly funded child care agencies accepted children without regard to ethnic background. She devoted her career to fighting for children's rights, taking cases related to juvenile delinquency, child abuse and segregation, wives and children who were in dire need of assistance, adoptions, and child welfare. Bolin defended justice and equality for women and children from the bench from New York's family court for four decades. She worked alongside First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt to decrease juvenile crimes among young boys. In 1978, Judge Bolin retired at the age of 70 after having been reappointed three times. Beyond the courtroom, Judge Bolin was on the board of the National Urban League, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Child Welfare League. She also received honorary degrees from many institutions across the country, including Williams College, where her father was the first black graduate. Judge Jane Matilda Bolin passed away on January 8, 2007, in Queens, New York. Those gains we have made were never graciously and generally granted, generously granted. We had to fight every inch of the way in the face of sometimes insufferable humiliations said Judge Bolin in 1958, highlighting women's rights. These words will echo forever as her legacy continues. Now, Sister Arnold asked if I would give a few comments on my career in light of this phenomenal woman who came some 48 years before me. I was a music major at Howard University in Washington, D.C. during the period of time of the Vietnam War and continuing civil rights struggles. I was motivated by all of this to change my course in life and pursue becoming a lawyer. After graduating with a degree in music, I applied to law schools and decided to attend the University of Connecticut Law School. My class at UConn was only the third to have black students, 12 in my class, 14 in the class before me, and two in the class before that. Needless to say, with such an influx of students of color in such a short time, the atmosphere at the school was sometimes tense and rife with subtle as well as overt racism from some students as well as teachers and the dean. After law school and a brief period of private practice, I worked as an assistant attorney general for the state of Connecticut for 17 years, during which time I represented the Department of Children and Families. I was one of two black lawyers who came into the AG's office at approximately the same time and was the first black female to work there. 
This was in 1979. The black male who started working there left to go into the corporate world a few weeks after he started, and I was the only black person in the attorney general's office for approximately 12 years. I was appointed to the bench in 1996 by Governor John Rowland and was the second black female to become a superior court judge in Connecticut. Again, I was part of a landmark class. Ours was a large class of judges, 10, with five Democrats and five Republicans, one black female, one Puerto Rican female, and one white female, two black males, one Jewish male, two males of Catholic Italian descent, and two Anglo white males. Our class was the subject of much discussion and acclaim. It was several years before another female of color was appointed to the bench in Connecticut. While on the bench, I presided primarily over criminal matters and, like Judge Bolin, ju juvenile matters involving delinquency, truancy, child welfare, neglect, abuse, and termination of parental rights. I served two terms as judge and became a senior judge and retired in Attention to Numbers chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he, whom he married. 
And they said, has the Lord indeed only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man in Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is, is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, my prey. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey on until Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hazeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. These words are true, and they can be trusted. We like to use these words. We all have a role to play. We all have a role to play. Miriam is the first woman of the Bible who is a national hero. She is the first prophetess, and she is one of the first leaders of a movement, and she is simultaneously a big sister. While we acknowledge Jochebed, Moses' mother, and while we lift up Pharaoh's daughter who adopted Moses, we also lift up Zipporah, who is the Midianite woman who married the Hebrew, who had grown up in the palace of Egypt and married a man who had blood on, who had blood on his hands. We often forget and overlook Miriam, a female revolutionary in the spirit of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Ida B. Wells. We lift up Moses and Aaron, but we forget about Miriam, who was literally a Fanny Lou Hammer and Shirley Chisholm in ancient Goshen, Israel, and Egypt. Miriam is briefly discussed in snippets in the Pentateuch. Her name is called in the book of Exodus, in Numbers, and in Deuteronomy, and again in the historical writings in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 3, and in the prophecy of Micah chapter 6, verse 3 as well. We are first introduced to her in Exodus chapter 2. She is the leader in the movement to help save her brother. In Exodus 2, the Bible says that Jochebed, in fear of the decree of Pharaoh to have all male Hebrews killed, takes her son and makes a basket, a mini ark, and waterproofs it with pitch and tar, and sends it floating down the Nile River with Moses in the basket in the shallow parts in hopes that someone with wealth would find the child, adopt, and raise Moses. The ancient practice of putting a child in a basket and putting the child in shallow water with the hopes of someone finding the child was the equivalent to abandoning a child in modern times at a hospital or orphanages. Parents did this knowing nothing could happen to them but that their child would be safe. While Moses' mother, Jochebed, is thinking of Moses' future, it was Miriam who ensured that she and her mother were part of Moses' future. As the basket, as the Bible says, went floating down the river, it was Miriam who watched it, and she was the one who saw that it was Pharaoh's daughter and her court who were bathing close to the area where, where Moses' basket just happened to stop. It was Miriam who saw that Pharaoh's daughter opened the basket. It was Miriam who approached Pharaoh's daughter quietly and asked if she would like her to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. It was Miriam who went to get Moses' mother to be the nurse for the Hebrew child in Pharaoh, at Pharaoh's daughter's request. Miriam knew who Moses' mother was and kept it a secret from Pharaoh's daughter. It was Miriam who orchestrated the safety of her brother. Moses would be nursed and cared for in the enemy's camp in the Egyptian palace 
but nursed by his biological mother. While this is a unique story, what is most spectacular is that Miriam was only seven years old when she took leadership in the future development of her brother. At age seven, Miriam was not afraid to talk to an elite from the aristocratic class. At age seven, she knew how important it was for her to get Moses' biological mother to be the one to nurse Moses. She knew at age seven how to be a spy. She knew how to handle a delicate situation. She knew how unique it would be for a Hebrew to be raised in the palace of the Egyptians. Miriam showed poise, intelligence, and finesse. At age seven, she knew that the story of her people and what was at stake and how important it was for her brother Moses to live. At age seven, she understood what Pharaoh's decree meant. She understood that Moses was not supposed to live. She was a revolutionary before the movement was even birthed. She understood her role and she played in it. If it were not for Miriam at age seven, Jochebed may not have been Moses' nurse. While most girls at age seven are playing with dolls, she was literally saving her family. While most girls are dreaming of being older, uh, she was plotting on how to save her people. The second time we see Miriam is after Moses now returns from Midian. Miriam, the child revolution, Miriam, who is a child revolutionary, is now Miriam, the adult revolutionary, who is working closely with her big brother Aaron and her little brother Moses to free her people. I've often wondered what it was like for her to have to work under her brothers. Aaron, who was not mentioned much outside of him being Moses' mouthpiece, and later as the father of the first priest, and Moses, the brother she helped save, who grew up in the palace while the rest of them worked as slaves. What was it like as a woman who had to play second fiddle and third fiddle for a brother that she rescued? Was she overprotective of Moses? Was she a little jealous of Moses? Was she upset with Aaron and Moses? Was it hard for her to relate to Moses since his early life growing up in the palace was different from hers? Did the men in the community respect her? Did they know that their leader was alive because of her? How does she handle the magnitude of her role and the reality of being a woman in ancient Goshen and Egypt as a slave? The Bible never says whether she was married or not. Uh, did Miriam have a husband? Was she married? Did she have children? Could she have, could she have children? What did she look like? What what kind of men were attracted to her? How did she wear her hair? Was she so involved in the liberation of her people that she did not have a social life or a personal life? Did Miriam have friends? Were her only friends people uh, who were also like her concerned about liberation? When did she go to school? Could Miriam read? Could she write? Could she draw? Could she cook? Could she build things with her hands? Was she a good public speaker? What did she like? What things didn't she like? What did she do? What was she good at? These are the things that, that the Bible leave out when we are talking about Miriam. Well, what we do know is that when Moses returns to Egypt to free his people, she is right there with him and with her brother Aaron. They are leaders of the movement. Miriam was there in Egypt throughout the 10 plagues. When Moses leads the people through the Red Sea, Miriam is right there as a leader making sure that the women and children make it also on the other side. The Bible says, when Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, and the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam the prophetess, the prophet Aaron's sister, took a, a, took a, a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with trembles and dancing. Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. As soon as they make it, the Bible says that Miriam breaks out in a praise dance. If we don't, know, if we don't learn anything else from Miriam, we ought to know what, is, what it is to be a praiser. She may have been a revolutionary. She may have had to deal with men and the sexism of her day. But we do know that the Lord called her to praise the Lord. When she saw the Lord deliver her and her people, she said, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. And she let us know that when we praise the Lord, we must be specific about what God has done and is doing in our lives. What we can learn from this woman, this revolutionary, this praise worshiper, is that in the midst of victory, in the midst of our freedom being sought, we ought to stop and praise the Lord. 
Miriam knew that for every mountain God had brought her people through, that they had also come through a storm. Miriam knew about grace and knew that grace is amazing. And so today I want to encourage us to praise the Lord and praise him in season and out of season and praise him with trembling dance and praise him with lute and heart, praise him with our lips and praise him with our voice, praise him with our, bi our bodies because the Bible says, let, let, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. The second thing that she teaches us is that life is serious and all of us make poor and bad judgment calls even when the evidence before us makes sense for us to do the right thing. Miriam and Aaron were upset that Moses had married an Ethiopian or an African woman. Moses' wife is named Zipporah. She is a Midianite and they are enemies of the Hebrew people. It is not completely certain if Aaron and Miriam were upset with his wife Zipporah or if Moses married again and his second wife was an African as well. The Bible does not say and it is uncertain if, uh, and it is uncertain. But Miriam is upset because Moses married a woman who did not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. They were upset because he married someone who did not know the God of Sarah, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, or Rachel. Miriam, the Bible says that she was concerned. And so at seven years old, she played her part in keeping her family together. But because she was an adult now, her entire life, and because she was well-respected, she was opinionated. What, was this why she didn't approve of Moses' wife? Moses was a grown man and didn't pay her or Aaron any attention. But Moses didn't have to because the Lord made her leprous white as snow. Although she was a great woman, she had flaws. She was a revolutionary. She was a praiser. She was a big sister. She was a woman of God, but she had her opinions. I think it's important for us this morning to understand that we can love God with all our hearts, uh, with all our souls and with all our minds. And we can do great things in the kingdom of God and we can do great things in our church and in, in our community, but still have some major flaws. We all have moments of judgment and relapse. We all make mistakes. We all can fall prey to jealousy and gossip. Uh, that's why we need the Lord in our lives. We need to make sure that we are covered by the one uh, who takes all sin away. We, we need the Lord in, in our lives to check our egos. Uh, we need the Lord in our lives who can guide us and direct us. We need God because the Lord will put us, uh, yes he will, on the right path. Thank God for Miriam and the role she played for her people's liberation. Uh, she was an Esther before there ever was an Esther. Uh, big sisters, take care of your little brothers and sisters. Uh, take care of your family uh, because you may be called to help somebody be a liberator for your people. The life of Miriam is so important because it shows us that all of us have a role and a position to play in this journey of faith uh, that we call life. Uh, that's why the songwriter says, be not dismayed. Uh, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Uh, God will take care of you through every day, uh, over all the way. He will, he will, he will, he will take care of you. The Bible says that Miriam and Aaron got a little jealous because of all of the accolades that Moses uh, was getting. But the Bible also says that God does something and humbles them. And then Moses prays on their behalf. And then that situation is rectified. You know, we live in the midst of broken promises, broken relationships. The reality is we live in a broken and in a fragmented world. But God sent Jesus thousands of years ago, millennia ago, to heal that brokenness for us. We don't have to die in our sin. We don't have to die in our brokenness. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible also says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will and you shall be saved. There may be someone this morning who has never publicly professed that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. If you desire a relationship with him, let's pray together this morning. Gracious God, I come today recognizing that I have tried to live separate from your wisdom, your way, your truth, and your life. God, I recognize that I am a sinner, but I desire a relationship with you. God, I come this morning confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart that Christ was raised from the dead. God, I now know that I am saved. God, I know that, that I am not perfect, 
And from this day forward, I will not be perfect, but at least I know I am saved. Thank you, God, for saving me. Our second call this morning, there may be someone who was already saved, but does not have a church where they can work out their soul salvation. Even in the midst of COVID-19, our church is still moving forward, still building spiritual community in the name of Jesus Christ. The New Wave movement says that you can be saved and a Christian and not in church, for the devil is a liar. If you are a Christian, you must be a part of a household of faith where you can work out your soul salvation in fear and trembling. If you would like to become a part of this mighty great cloud of witnesses known as Reed Chapel, we would absolutely love to have you. Call us at 803-786-0701. Call us at 803-786-0701. Or email us at office at reedchapel.org. Journey with us on this journey of faith that we call life at Reed Chapel.
May the Lord bless and keep you. May, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Okay. All right. Get ready to come in. And today, uh, 